cross-section and if you see a triangle, then it is called a cutting needle. Now that cutting needle also can be of two types, where the apex of the triangle is towards the concavity of the needle or where the apex of the triangle is towards the convexity of the needle. Both are cutting. When the apex is towards the concavity, it is known as a, just a cutting needle. And when the apex is towards the convexity, then it is called a reverse cutting needle. So the question is, when do we use each of them? The round body needle is used for delicate tissues, like for example, peritoneum, mesentery, intestine, things like that. It cannot penetrate through tough tissues like skin. Contrary to what we may think, skin is a very tough structure. It has got a thick dermis, and the dermis contains a lot of elastic tissue and collagen fibers. So when we do this on the skin, we use the cutting needle. Now in the cutting, I told you there are two types, a cutting and a reverse cutting. When do we use each of them? For regular suturing, most of the suturing that you will be doing, including normal skin everywhere, we use the cutting needle. The cutting needle goes through the skin very easily. In fact, when you get the chance in actual clinical situations, you try to use a round body needle on the skin and you'll have hell. It will just not go through. So cutting needle is used for the skin. <coughs> then when do we use the reverse cutting? We use the reverse cutting when we put very fine subcuticular stitches, like for example, on the face. That's when we do so. But we won't be using, so here most of us will be using cutting needle. So these are a few basic points about needles. Next about suture material. A few quick things about suture material. This is nylon. It can also be, if it's black, it's nylon. If it is blue, it is proline, polypropylene. Both are synthetic material. Both are non-absorbable. The quick classification of suture materials, you can have absorbable suture materials, non-absorbable suture materials. Absorbable ones, ones which get absorbed on their own, they are used for tissues inside. You don't have to remove them. Non-absorbable are the ones which are put in the skin, so we have to remove them after five days, seven days, 10 days, depending on the requirement. Again, among these, they are subdivided further into synthetic and natural. So these are all synthetic, non-absorbable material. That's the one which we will be using. So the full classification is there. This can just go through them. So this is a non-absorbable synthetic. And if you notice, if you just run your hand across it, you'll find that it is very smooth. This is known as a monofilament material. That again reduces the trauma to the tissues. There are certain types, like for example here, braided. There are some material like, for example, polyester fiber. They are ethyborn. These are twisted filaments. They are called braided. They are not monofilament. They are multifilament. They are again more traumatic. But then we use them in separate situations. For most of the skin surgeries, we will be using monofilament, non-absorbable, synthetic suture material, which is already swaged to the needle. So these are the few basic characteristics about the needle and suture material. Now let's take a few basic instruments. Needle holder. <coughs> As the term implies, it is meant to hold the needle. Parts of a needle holder, these are the jaws of the needle holder. This is the fulcrum, the box type joint. This is the stem of the needle holder, the ratchet, and the handle. The ratchet has got three clicks, depending on how much pressure you want to apply. One, two, so, and with just a little bit of finger twist, you can remove it. It just comes out on its own very quickly. You will find that in an actual instrument set, you will find there will be a lot of difficulty in identifying the difference between a needle holder and a hemostat. They all look very safe. I'm not saying at first glance they look very similar. The difference is, a hemostat, the jaws will be very long. The joint will be very close to the handle. That's the difference. Why here we have this? Jaws very close, and the jaws very small, is to get a good mechanical advantage so that we can get a good grip on the needle. Technique of holding the needle holder. There are two ways of doing it. Next one, please. Yes. One technique is as I've shown here. The ring finger will go through this, the lower one, the thumb will go through that one. Only the Tips of the digits will go, not like this. This is a very wrong method. You do not get good control. The best way to get control is with using the tips of the fingers. The middle finger will give support, and 
and the index finger will give control. This is one way of doing it. Another way of doing it, both are equally correct, it all depends on the preference of the surgeon, is to hold it like this. After you have, of course, ratcheted it, hold it like this. In the palm of your hand and use the index finger for a control. I personally prefer this. Many people prefer this. So both are shown there in the picture. <clears throat> now comes the next point. How to hold the needle in the needle holder. Very important. Most of us are right-handed. So therefore, the apex of the needle should be pointing towards your left because I'm going to go like this. And I'm going to hold the needle <coughs> right with the tip of my needle holder. One, two, usually two clicks are sufficient. The long axis of the needle and the long axis of the needle holders should be exactly at right angles to each other. It should not be angulated like this or like this. They are used only in very special situations. They are not for you. They are used only for suturing the depths and things like that. For 99% of the time, it should be at right angles. It should not be reversed. As I said just now, it should not be like this because we are all right-handed people. If you are a left-handed, then of course, otherwise it's... Okay. How much pressure to apply? If you apply too much pressure, as you can see in the picture, this picture shows. If I give too much pressure or the needle holder is too big for the needle, when I apply pressure, it tends to straighten out the needle. That's not good. On the other hand, if I apply too little pressure or if the needle holder is too small, then the needle will do this and you will see it. It will wobble. When you're trying to take a bite, it will go this way or that way. So, right pressure, right size of the needle for the needle holder. Needle. Usually two clicks are sufficient. Where to hold? There are three places to hold. One is either at the junction of the medial two-thirds and lateral one-third, approximately here. Another is to hold in the middle. Or another is to hold at the junction of the medial one-third and lateral two-thirds. You will see different, different situations. To give you a quick rule of thumb, if I want to take a deep bite of a tissue, big needle and a deep bite, then I'll naturally hold it very far away so that I can take a good deep bite. Remember, this is the bite width and this is the bite depth. On the other hand, there are certain situations when I want to take a very fine bite of a tissue, then I'm going to hold it very close to the tip. And I'm going to do it also in certain situations. And I'm going to take just the epidermis, then I'll take it very close. Obviously, when you want to take only the epidermis, you hold it so far away, it doesn't make sense. So. These are some of the salient points about needle and needle holder. So all these things are shown there. So, so just to demonstrate to you, I held it in the middle. After clamping it, this is how I'm going to do the suture. You can use your own technique. You will develop your own <coughs> methods of doing it. You see, I get very good control, 100% control like this. Okay, next instrument, the forceps. These are called thumb forceps. For the simple reason, we are holding between thumb and index finger. This is the next important accessory which we have to use for using for suturing. Let's take the most important one which we need for the skin. You can see the tip here. This has got two projections, the one, the lower one, one projection. This is called a toothed thumb force. This is ideal for holding tough structures like the skin told you already skin is a tough structure. When you hold it like this, the tooth, they go, they mesh into each other and therefore you get a good grip of the tissue. So they are used for holding tough structures like the skin, linea alba and such places. When do we use the plain thumb force? If you can note the plain thumb force does not have any teeth. Instead, it's got a few serrations on the inner surface, that's all. Just to give a little bit of friction. This is used again for delicate structures like mesentery, peritoneum, intestine, etc. Obviously, in, if you hold the peritoneum with this moment you do it, it will just cut through. So, you cannot
not use this, you have to use the. So for us, we are going to use the do thumb force it. Method of holding the do thumb force it. It should always be, when I'm doing the suturing, remember I have to hold the end, which I'm going to suture. So it should be at right angles to the long axis of the suture line. <coughs> not like this, not like this. And how to hold it, this is the absolute correct method. If you develop the right method now, then that becomes a habit. You should not hold it like this and things like that. That's not the right way. It should be held like this so that you can get a good grip. That's why it is called a thumb forcep. Okay. That's about the thumb forcep. Now comes the next one. The scissors. Again, there are two types of scissors. Here we have only one. One scissor is the straight. This is the one that you see here. I'm going to tell you briefly about the curved one also. The straight scissor is used always to cut non-tissue material like the threads. And the straight scissor is never to be used for tissues. The straight scissor has got a pointed one, pointed limb and a blunt one. The pointed limb is the one which goes under the loop of the thread. And we should always cut with the apex, absolute tip of the scissors. Why? I'll give you a practical example of what I have seen. Once the assistant was trying to cut from the base of the scissors and he did realize that the tip had gone to the eye because it was sitting on the base. I was watching and I couldn't control myself. I shouted, what the hell are you doing? Because he tried to cut the thread, there was switching going on here. He tried to cut like that and the tip was going towards the eye. Never use the base. Use the tip. When do we use, it's not here but I'm just going to tell you briefly, when do we use the Curved scissor. Curved scissor is used for cutting tissues. Like for example, rectus sheath. Why is it curved? Because the surgeon is the only person who cuts straight with a curved scissor. <laughs> That's the usual say. See for example, this is a laparotomy going on. Okay, I've cut the skin with this knife. Then comes the rectus sheath. Patient is lying here. Head end is here, foot end is here. As a right right handed person, you're standing on the right side of the patient. If I were to cut the rectus sheath with a straight scissor, what happens? I'll have to go like this. You are not supposed to move around too much in the surgical field. So if my scissor is curved, I'm going to remain standing here and I'm going to cut like this. So I can remain standing here and I can keep cutting like this. So that's why the curved scissor is used to cut tissues. That's why we don't have it here. A quick word about the blade. Not that you'll be using too much of it, but I'll just show you. No, no, they are all okay. not This is a Bard Parker handle. The handle is the one which is reused, sterilized. And the blade is the one which is removed and disposed. Because we cannot sterilize the blade. It is detachable in normal situations. There are many sizes of blades, 10, 11, 12, 15, 21, 20, 21, 22, 23, depending on size, this is size 10. And the handle, how to cut, we're not going to cut it, I'm just going to show you. Hold it like a pen, not like a stabbing instrument, not like a fighting instrument, but not like, like a pen, because it's a delicate situation. Give control with the next finger. Angle should be 45 degrees with the skin. First 45 degrees, go vertically up, go straight down, bring it back to 45 degrees, give a little bit of counter traction to the skin, otherwise it will punch and keep proceeding in a straight line with a steady hand. As you go further and further, you'll find the skin is becoming bunched lower down. Bring your hand further down. Again, bring your hand further down. Again, bring your hand further down. Bring your hand further down. Bring your hand further down. Bring your hand until you reach the end of transition. So this is just a technique. You're not going to do any cutting now, but just to complete the whole picture. So okay, I have demonstrated the basics of the instruments. The first suturing which I'm going to demonstrate will be the knot tying technique I'll do, I'll show you where I put the suture. Then we'll come to that. This is the, we'll do four suturing techniques. There are many of them written here, four essential ones. The simple interrupted, that's the first one you'll learn. So let's do the full thing now. We are going to hold the needle holder, the needle with the needle holder. the thumb forceps. Let's say I'm going to do a suturing here. The first one. 
the simple interrupted one. It's really not very difficult at all. So like I told you, you can hold it either this way or this way. I prefer to hold it this way because I get more control. You should be able to hear the clicks, then you know how much pressure you've applied. Now it's stable. No that note access. Note everything. Watch. So suppose I'm doing the switch ring. With the tooth forcer, hold one end of the place where you want to put the switcher. Here for your guidance, they have already put dots here. In an actual situation, you will not have these dots. So we have to determine approximately half a centimeter this side to half a centimeter that side. So take a good grip of the skin, a good grip so that you can lift it up. Take the first bite through full thickness with a slight curving motion so that, as you can see in the lower picture, less of the epidermis and more of the dermis is taken. There's a meaning behind that because we want the edges to be slightly everted. Inversion is not a good thing. Eversion is required. That only gives a good healing, epidermis to dermis, epidermis and dermis to dermis, and it produces a good hairline scar. So that's why we have curved needles. And of course, we do use straight needles for various situations, but here, curved is the... So a slight more of the epidermis, a little less of the dermis, full thickness. If you find difficulty, you can take it out and you can take the next one or you can do it both in one shot. It doesn't matter, it depends on how big the needle is and how deep the suture on the, the skin is. I've just removed it. So one bite. Next bite, again take a good grip of the opposite side. Give a slight push and you can see the tip of the needle pushing. So I know approximately this is the way, place I want to come out come out here. Once you release it, catch hold of the tip and keep pull it out with a curving motion. Keep pulling till you reach an approximate reasonable size. Don't keep this too long because remember you'll be cutting it off. This will be a waste. We have to conserve material. At least if you don't, your assistant is going to jump at you. So keep it of sufficient length so that you know we can afford to. Now the previous slide that not time technique is shown. Watch this. Another thing which I forgot to tell you about the suture material was when I was talking about is the not holding characteristics of suture materials. These monofilament materials, synthetic non-observable monofilament material, they tend to slip. You can try it. You can take a piece of nylon and you try to make a loop. You make two throws of a knot, it will slip off. If you take a cotton throws or your shoelace for example you don't put 10 knots it holds nylon synthetic material they tend to slip so we have to use multiple throws otherwise they will slip okay now how to tie the knot the long end two loops clockwise tip hold the tip cross give it sufficient pull to make it a little tight but it is not sufficiently tight yet because it will slip out see it is already slipping out now with my hand like this anti-clockwise two loops again hold the tip and same direction my hand will come back to the left tighten a little bit four throws two two I usually like to put six or eight because anything less than that tends to slip. Again, two loops. Catch hold of the tip. Again, cross. Again, two loops. Anti-clockwise. Catch hold of the tip. Bring it back. And once you have finally made the knot, eight throws, give a little flip like that. So that the knot goes away from the suture line. Either this side or this side. Never keep the knot on the suture line because it will give a very painful and a bad scar. Once this is over, don't remove it. Keep the tension. Take the scissor, the apex below the knot, cut it approximately half a centimeter away. Why do we keep this much length? Two reasons. 
reason number one. Seven days later, you'll have to remove it. If you keep it too small, you will not get a good grip to remove it. I'm going to show you how to cut it. The second reason is, as I told you, they tend to slip. Even after putting eight throws, if I keep that end very small, it might slip off. So, so I'm going to do one another one first, and then I'm going to cut towards it, uh, the knot, and then you'll start doing your own. So this is the technique. I'm going to do the next one. One more, just to, so that you can see it. Good grip. Full thickness, little more of the epidermis. Opposite side. Full thickness. Curving out. Double clockwise. Hold the tip. Anti-clockwise. Hold the tip. Clockwise. Hold the tip. Anti-clockwise. Hold the tip. Flip. The full technique. Seven days later, the patient comes to you. You're going to remove this. There are, that slide is also there. How many days later to remove the sutures? Most times it's seven days, sometimes it's five days, sometimes it's nine days, sometimes it's ten days. You take the average figure, seven days. Catch hold of a grip with the tooth forcep. Catch hold of the knot. Get a good grip. Not on the suture line, but away from the suture line. Put the pointed portion under the loop. Cut. And when you're pulling out the knot, don't pull this way because I have experienced it. Sometimes the suture line is still not fully healed when you put to pull this way, it pops open. So pull like this. Next one. Get a good grip. Put the pointed end under the loop, away from the suture line. Cut with the tip. Pull. Pull procedure done. Please go back to your respective stations and start off with the first suturing.